Hello, how are you all? Thank you for joining me. I'm Robin Vogels from Personnel Relocations. I'm based in Melbourne in Australia and I'm the owner of Personnel Relocations. I'm also the co-author of Your DIY Move Guide and also about to launch a new business called Immigrant Networks, which is helping with migrants to be able to network, um, get to know the job market, hopefully some recruitment, and also, um, I've gone blank. For those of you who might be joining me for the first time, you will know that this is not a high-end production, but it is full of good information. In fact, better information that you might find than you might find on social media. So Immigrant Networks is there for, to help with job skills, to help you upskill and get ready for work in Australia, help you with your interview techniques and also recruitment. So thank you for joining me. I really appreciate your support and, and I'm pleased that you're here to get some expert information. Um, asking for information on social media can, I don't know, I, I just cringe sometimes when I see some of the answers. Um, there was a lady a few weeks ago who had um, asked a question probably about suburbs and you know you you just get so many replies, 70, 80, 90 replies and I don't think it helped her to shortlist areas at all. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is what to pack and what not to pack. So just trying to give you some information on how you can save on your furniture removals, what options might be available to you, what prescription medicines you can bring or how you can bring prescription medicines in, and a few other things. I've actually consulted with my removalists team that I work with. Kieran has been wonderful in giving, me, giving us some tips. Um, which I have here for you and I've spoken to a couple of GPs to get some frequently asked questions or common mistakes if you like. So if you're sitting with a cup of tea or a glass of wine enjoy and um, please feel free to ask me any questions. It is nice to know that I've got people out there and that you are actually listening to me so um, just give me a thumbs up and let me know where you are watching from today because some of the information that I might that not that I might be giving the information that I'm giving out today I might have lived in that in the country where you currently living and that way I can at least tailor make what I'm saying to um, to the country that you're coming from it's always a lot easier when you can relate you know if I talk about the NHS in, in England versus Medicare here in Australia it makes it a little bit easier for you to understand so let's jump straight off I've got a couple of um, I'm trying to be clever and have a couple of technical computers and things around me to be able to watch out for any comments um, but um, I'll probably stop every now and again and, and check if you've got any questions. So please fire them away. Do let me know where you are watching from. I always like to just get a bit of support. It's kind of strange standing here just talking to um, my phone, <laughs> basically, um, a basic camera. So when you're packing for Australia, let's start with the big stuff. Australia is a long way away and you want to pack carefully. Um, Starting with your removalists, let's start there, I think. So you've got a few ways that you can move your goods to Australia. Before I go into this, I just want to remind you, if you haven't heard already, and I'm sure if you're looking into shipping at the moment, you have, um, sorry, I just saw somebody saying there's 150 comments. I thought, no, that can't be right. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to get distracted and stay on track. Okay. Um, if you haven't heard already, there are major shipping delays in any kind of shipping and the shipping costs have gone up 300% on some of the routes. So depending where you're coming from and if you got your quotes a year ago, definitely don't be trying to compare quotes on, online because the shipping costs are changing monthly, if not weekly at the moment. Sometimes up, sometimes down. Um, but let's just touch on that a second. If you're trying to compare quotes with somebody else, and I see this question all the time on social media, I see people saying, can somebody just give me a bit of an idea of how much it might cost for a 20 foot container going from Cape Town to Melbourne? And it sounds like a simple enough question, but there's many things that can affect the quote, okay? One is access. Okay, so seeing I've used Cape Town as an example, Cape Town, um, my, a lot of parts of South Africa, and even London, for example, you can have 
difficult access. So if you think of a London alley where a truck can't get down the alley or the laneway, they have to use a ferry vehicle. And the same in South Africa. I had it in Singapore as well, where we lived in a sort of a compound um, or townhouse development. The truck can't get, you know, if you've got a huge 40 foot container, they're massive. The truck can't get into those estates sometimes. And if they have to give a ferry vehicle to get to your goods and bring them to the truck, they have the cost of the vehicle to consider as well as the additional labor. So that's going to affect the price of your container. So asking online, there are too many variables for you to be able to compare properly with somebody else. It could come down to what's being packed, okay? Um, you might only have two TVs, but Joe Blogs down the road's got four TVs, and they're all plasma screens and have to have special wooden crates built for them. Or he could have a lot more artwork than you have got that needs specialist crating. So what's being packed, the size of what being, is being packed, can you know you're moving a 20 foot or a 40 foot container but the packing and the labor is where a lot of the cost comes in another thing just on the on the shipping while we're talking about the shipping delays if you are sharing a container expect it to be delayed even longer so at the moment i'm sort of saying to my clients rather take a full use 20 foot container than try and share a container there's actually not that much difference in the price sometimes. But you've also got the options like Seven Cs, and Seven Cs bring a huge um, tea crate, if you like, and you pack it yourself. So work with your removalists to see where you can save money. And I'm not gonna go past furniture removals without talking about insurance. This is where so many people get caught out. You might have got three quotes, you've had them all inspected, and I really insist I probably can't insist, but <laughs> I really encourage you to um, have assessments done. Actually have somebody physically come and inspect your home because then there's no chance of them turning around on the day when they've packed up half your goods and they turn around and say to you, oh, you know, it's underestimated on the size. We're going to need this. We're going to need that. We're going to need extra crew. It's going to cost you. We've already got half your furniture in the truck. You've got no option but to pull out the checkbook. Sorry, that was a bit old school, the checkbook, but <laughs> you, you get what I mean, credit card. Um, so, so don't get caught out, get physical assessments done. So much is done online now, and it's just you leading yourself into trouble. On the insurance, when you're comparing those three quotes, and you've perhaps read my book and said, Robin said we have to get three quotes, um, you might see that one quote is cheaper than the other and think, oh yeah, I really like that salesman. Yeah, here's the cheapest. I'm going to go with that one. Read the fine print. Read the insurance. If nothing else, make sure you read the insurance. Okay, because insurance is based on the value that you place on your goods. And if you, you haven't, at the time of the assessment, you have not said whether your goods are worth $200,000 or $50,000. And the insurance can be two to three, sometimes even three and a half percent of the value that you place on. So when you get your quotes, although Joe Bloggs might look cheaper, his insurance could be higher and you're gonna pay even more. So really make sure that you check the insurance on your quotes. Check the excess on your quotes. Check how that is built up. I had a client a little while ago who was very upset. All her kitchen, um, crockery had been broken but the excess on her insurance was two and a half thousand dollars the crockery wasn't worth that so make sure you've got your crock your not crockery your insurance at the best possible rate and the best possible excess so that's just one part of your um, removals quotes that you you really need to make sure of other things like you know checking if it's so if you see the words lcl or groupage that means you're sharing a container, okay? To save, let me stop there a second and just see what comments we've got, and then I'll come back to what furniture you should bring with you and what you can comfortably leave behind. So let me just have a quick look here and see if I can see the comments, because I'm trying to be very technical savvy today, but for those of you that know me, probably know that I'm not that technical savvy, and hopefully my voice doesn't come through. Okay. 
Right, we've got Port Elizabeth, South Africa. There we go. Um, Cape Town. Oh, we've definitely got lots of South Africans. Okay. I'm not seeing any Brits. Where are the Brits tonight? I normally have loads of Brits on here. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll keep going anyway. Um, so let's get back to, so when I get to um, medical, we'll, I'll tailor this a little bit more to the South African, South Africans and what you're used to as well. And you'd be happy to know that I've spoken to a South African doctor here. So I've got you covered. South Africa, you, you're okay. Um, the, ah, oh, Cassie, hello Cassie. <laughs> Nice to see you. Right, um, where was I? What to bring and what not to bring. Mattresses. Mattresses in Australia are different to British and South African mattresses. So for an example, a, um, gosh, it's many, many years since I lived in South Africa, but 20, a, a three-quarter bed in South Africa is almost the same as a double bed here. And then we go double, queen, king. So just make sure of that. If you have a king size bed that you're bringing to Australia, preferably it should be in a bed frame. The problem we have here is a lot of our um, staircases and townhouses, for example, I've seen many clients having to leave their king bed downstairs in the garage because the um, base can't get up the stairs. So here in Australia, our bases, so the underneath of the mattress, if it's not on a um, frame. The underneath of the mattress here in Australia is two single beds, but from other countries it's one solid base, and that base cannot get up the stairs. So if you have a king bed that you're thinking of bringing with you that has one solid base, leave it behind. Mattresses take up a lot of space in your container. They don't have a long life, especially if you talk to bacterial experts. They, they yeah, don't, don't keep them for very long. Um, so look at, at replacing your mattresses when you get here. Another thing not to put into a container would be bookshelves. And it's kind of funny how many people do bring their bookshelves. And I think it's just because you don't notice them in your own home. And by the time the movers come and they've taken all the books and everything off, the bookshelves can take up a lot of space in your container and they're very cheap to replace here. So bookshelves I wouldn't bring, mattresses I wouldn't bring, um, and another point just on the mattresses, it's all very well if you do bring your mattresses, will your linen fit? Are you going to bring a lifetime supply of your linen? Do you, there again, you're probably better off to buy linen and mattresses when you get here. All rental properties come with a dishwasher. Okay, I'm going to say 98% come with a dishwasher. I have seen some cheap and cheerful apartments that don't have a dishwasher. They mostly have dishwashers. They will have all the window furnishings, so there will be curtains or blinds um, across the window. So you don't need to bring any curtains with you. I know when I lived in France, very few of the houses actually came with a kitchen. <laughs> I did, this was completely new to me that when you move house in France, you take your kitchen with you. Um, so yeah, Australia doesn't do that. We, we leave the kitchen for you. You're okay. Your cooker um, and oven are included in the rental as well. And that's pretty much everything and light fittings and things would usually be there as well. So those things are all included in, in your rental. So don't be bringing dishwashers with you. Um, pillows is a funny one. I don't know how many pillows are accumulated moving around the world because you don't necessarily, you've got enough to carry. And especially when I was moving, I had kids, small brats and you don't want to carry the pillows with you, but you kind of need them quite soon after you arrive. And pillows can be one of those things that a good night's sleep is important. So um, again, you don't want to be putting a pillow in a container that could take six months or three months to get here. You don't want to bring it on the plane. Get rid of it before you leave. Um, I can see your questions coming through. Thank you. I will, I will come back to them. Um, but keep them coming because it's nice to see that people are listening. <laughs> All right, so mattresses, bookshelves, pillows, leave them behind. Um, in fact, Personal Relocations has just started a service where we've got an international starter pack. So many of our clients were arriving and camping in the house. So they would go and buy blow-up mattresses, a couple of fold-out picnic tables and plastic 
cutlery and things and, and just get through the first few nights. But we've actually started a service now where we will order a mattress for you, um, pantry shop, crockery cutlery, a few things to get you started. It's not high end because we're trying to keep the cost down, but it is enough to get you through that you can replace it as time goes on. Okay. I think I've pretty much covered a fair amount in furniture removals and I don't want to um, waste too much time. I'm just going to tell you what um, Kieran's top tips were. So Kieran is um, part of the removals team that I work from. He said the day prior to packing, make sure you take your passport and any other important information and put it in your bag well away from the packing team. What I've done in the past um, is designated my dining room area as home base if you like okay so the dining room doesn't have a lot it's not like the kitchen where you might have two or three packers in there actually wrapping up paper and boxes and glasses and all sorts of things the dining room is actually quite a quiet area and very often it's just maybe the dining room table and the chairs so designate a, a part of the house like that that you can put your suitcases and anything else that the removalists must not touch. I even have in the past thrown a blanket over it with a big sign saying do not touch. So I can't emphasize that enough. And you know what I did in one house? <laughs> and I tell you this not to laugh at me. Well, you're welcome to laugh, I don't mind. But just so you can learn. You know all the little cupboard keys I don't know if we get them that much anymore, but we had one house where we had cupboard keys and keys for, for drawers and window keys. The removalists packed the whole lot. So when we needed the keys, well, the new tenants just had to wait till our container arrived a few months later and we had to post the keys back. Watch out for those little things. They're the ones that can sometimes catch you out. I'm going to come back to... Um, important documentation to bring with you as well so I'll talk about that just now um, and Kieran was saying one in 20 moves ends up with the client having their passport packed and it's impossible to go and look for it once it's packed <laughs> it's, I couldn't imagine trying to do that get the professionals to pack for you and I can't emphasize this enough just think of where your container might be it might it might be at the top of the pile on this big ship that's going like this <laughs> if you value your things get them packed properly get them packed by the professionals don't try and do everything yourself i know there's wonderful tips on pinterest and putting paper plates between things and all these wonderful ideas seriously just get the professionals to pack it in fact the packing is not that expensive it's not a big portion of your removals anyway. So get packed and then it's insured properly as well. Um, third point, Kieran says, the, okay, no, that we were, that's just him saying you really shouldn't pack. <laughs> he made a third point of it, don't pack it yourself. And check the rules on what you can and cannot take. Different countries, even Western Australia, have serious rules surrounding food, religious items, books, electronics, pornography, and just about anything else. So that's something that you really need to watch out for is what you allow to bring in. And I see this question often, especially around wooden items. Can I bring my wooden chest in? Can I bring my wooden mask in? Whatever it might be. There's the website to check for everything is Border Force. The Border Force Australia website, you can check on there about absolutely anything. If you're wanting to bring firearms, weapons, kitchen knives, and you're not sure if they're allowed, go onto the Border Force website. When this um, Facebook Live is finished, we'll actually put that onto the bottom of, um, bottom of the notes for you, that website. I'm not that technical savvy that I can put it on for you now, but... Um, the Border Force website is where you can see absolutely everything of what you can bring and what you can't bring. So let me have a quick check of your questions before I move off furniture removals and go on to um, medicines. Cassie, that's a big day Wednesday. Would, we would like to ship AMC pots. I'm not sure what AMC pots are. Maybe if you can just give me a quick idea of what they are. Um, 
and you know i get asked that question a lot you know is it worth bringing is it worth bringing if something's sentimental to you by all means bring it if you want to but some sentimental things can just be too big um, and might be better loved if you left them with another member of the family so i know we've got a few south africans online here and south africans often want to bring I can't even pronounce the Afrikaans word, but you'll know what I'm talking about. The bench seats with the leather string on them and they want to know if they are okay to bring. Some of those can be really, really big. They're fine to bring, but remember that you're coming to a much smaller property. So I've seen too many of them land up on the hard waste collection because they can't be, they can't fit into the house here and they just get old basically. So just be careful what you do bring and don't bring um, Fahana, please, if you if you could um, tell me what that AMC pot is, I am more than happy to try and help you with that. I can't see any other questions at the moment, but it could be me being not very technical savvy, but I'll have one more look and then we'll move on to medicines and doctors. Fridges, Cassie. Um, yes and no. If you have a huge double door fridge, I probably wouldn't bring it. In fact, I probably wouldn't bring any fridge that's more than five, five years old, six years old. Fridges can last 10 or 15 years, but that's not without a three month sea voyage. So the sea voyage does add years onto your appliances. The other problem is many of the rental properties have a fixed cavity of where the fridge can fit. And if you suddenly arrive with a double door fridge, you might not be able to fit it and it's going to start restricting where you can live when you start looking at apartments or houses it's going to be oh the fridge can't fit and if it's if it's not a fridge that you you know that fond of it can land up in the garage but again it's just one of those things that might um, restrict your rental choice so you definitely can bring fridges um, but yeah, just take that into consideration. And I think for any white goods, washing machines, anything like that, if they're more than sort of five to eight years old, I wouldn't really bring them. Okay, let me just refresh that. I think I've got all your questions. Okay. Yep, that looks good. So just before I finish that, Cassie, good luck with the shippers on Wednesday, uh, with the um, packing on Wednesday. It's, it's a big day <laughs> and unpacking is even a bigger day. But it's unpacking is a bit more like Christmas. You just, you get excited because you're actually quite surprised at how many things you've forgotten about. Okay, so let's move on to um, prescription medicines because I see a lot of questions around prescription medicines. And I think what I want to do start with again is about that social media and I probably sound like I, I just hate social media and I don't but I think there's a, a place for social media where it can help you and I think if your questions are very specific it can help you even more um, but when it comes to medicines you probably want to get the right advice when I was talking to one of the doctors here they said they cannot believe and this is a true story that people have spent thousands of dollars getting all their prescription medicines because they thought they couldn't get it here. Our medical system here is very, very good. It's very comprehensive. And once you're in the system, you are very well looked after. It might have a different name, but the ingredients can be matched here. So make sure you bring everything with you. Whether you're coming to Australia on holiday or you're coming to live, you can only bring three months of prescription medicines with you. Don't take them out of the packaging and carry the written script from your doctor or typed script or whatever, but bring the script with you as well. So three months supply in its original packaging with the little label on that has the person's name obviously and the script. Three months three things you need to bring with you and that must travel with the person you can't bring medicines for somebody else especially prescription medicines don't even try and bring prescription medicines for somebody else the traveler who is prescribed the medicines they must be traveling with that person so i can't emphasize that 
enough. Just a, when you go and meet your GP for the first time and you take those prescription medicines with, they'll be able to understand what the ingredients are in those and they'll be able to say, well, this is what we have here in Australia. Okay, so um, be rest assured, it's a first world country, you're going to be looked after and you can replicate things. And a lot of those medicines will be available to you on Medicare. So why go and spend $10,000 before you arrive to get all your scripts when you can come here, enroll in Medicare and get all your prescription medicines sorted out. Um, another important thing, and I'd actually forgotten this, so I was quite glad when the doctor brought it up with me the other day, is go and get your history from your doctors. So don't forget to get a medical history. I would probably go into the doctors at least a month before you leaving. It is something that can take time and some doctors these days will actually charge for it. Um, but go in at least a month before, explain the situation, say you need your medical history and bring that along with you. The vaccination records now more than ever are very important. Okay, especially for children as well. Don't put them in your shipping container. Please put them in that little box that's going to come with you on the aeroplane. The immunization certificates, or in the UK you have the, the little red book. I still got my kids red book just for, <laughs> just for the fun of it. Might give it to them for their 21st. But um, yeah, so from the UK, bring your little red books that show all the immunizations. South Africa, again, your immunization certificates. Anywhere in the world you will have, especially these days, everybody has an immunization or vac vaccine record. Make sure you bring those with you. Depending on the country, you may have to do a catch up of the immunizations to match what we have in Australia. It is the doctors here will work through that with you. When you go and meet the doctor for the first time, they'll actually say, okay, you're missing this and you're missing that. Um, we need to do some booster shots here. But they'll work out a program for you. It's not a case of come back tomorrow and we'll just jab you five times. Okay, they'll actually work out a program to say, we can give this one now, but we need to wait two months before we give you that one. So that immunization program there's a database, if you like, here. It's called AIR for short, the Australian Immunisation Register. The Australian Immunisation Register holds all your information. And for many of the schools and the playgroups here in Australia, you have to actually be on AIR to start your playgroup. So what I really also want to emphasise is that you can't get away so for playgroup, for example, there's a no jab, no play policy. You can't get away from it. There's no coming and saying religious grounds or whatever it might be. You have to have your immunizations done. You have to be on the air register. Um, the, one of the doctors was mentioning to me about um, ephrodine. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Ef ephrodine. <laughs> Um, you can bring it into Australia, but large amounts will be confiscated. So I know that's one of those myths on social media again about what, which medicines you can and can't bring in. Um, yes, you can bring it in, but don't be unrealistic. In any medication that you're bringing, be assured Australia has what you need. Um, so don't feel like you have to try and squeeze in a few here and a few there. Just don't. It's, it's, it's probably a stress you don't need to deal with. Now, one of my clients this week um, that I've been working with has, a ch has children with special needs. So I want to just touch on that a little bit. If you do have a child with special needs that's coming into Australia, make sure you bring all their records with them. So one of the psychologists that I was talking to this week said it can't just be a simple GP note. It needs to be by a specialist, so a paediatrician or similar that's actually diagnosed the child and can give you the full history. So again, remember I said about bringing that um, history with you to Australia. Um, it's very important, especially if you have special needs. So if you've got a child that's maybe ADHD and is on Ritalin or similar medication for the ADHD, you have to go through an assessment process when you arrive in Australia. Um, now. The, for the British 
who are watching online. It's very similar to what you have there. You can't see a specialist here without being referred by your GP. So for the South Africans that are online here, it's different because Australia is different because in South Africa, you can drive, you're in the driving seat of who looks after you and what you get. It's not the same in Australia. Your GP is there, your GP is in the driving seat here. They will say, okay, you need this and you need that and they will refer you. Okay, so for the Brits, it's very similar to the NHS, but, but for the South Africans that are online, um, you're not in the driving seat here, but you are being cared for. I do promise you, you are, you are definitely being cared for. Um, so coming back to, to the Ritalin, again, they'll go through the dosage, they'll go through everything, you will be looked after. It can sometimes take time, and I know during COVID, some of the um, processes were a lot slower, um, but that's, it is getting better. We were having trouble during COVID with getting people onto Medicare and getting their Medicare cards. But you'll get a reference number as soon as you apply for Medicare and then you can take the next step. So step one when you arrive is go and see your GP. St uh, sorry, let me <laughs> try that again. Step one when you um, arrive is apply for your Medicare. Now that is being done online mostly at the moment. Step two is go and see your GP and of course taking in all those medical records with you. Your GP will then help you with all the assessments and everything that need to be done. Just talking quickly on um, medical insurance. Sorry about that. Told you I wasn't technically challenged. Oh, I am technically challenged. Um, just talking quickly about medical insurance. A couple of things to note is that Australia is very expensive for dentistry. So try and have, especially if you've got teenage children, get some extras onto your medical insurance to cover dentistry. Uh, personal experience, make sure you've got ambulance cover. Um, I had my daughter faint in a major shopping centre. Um, and of course the shopping centre to cover themselves decided it was a good idea to call an ambulance. $1,400 later, the insurance wouldn't cover it because it wasn't considered an emergency. In the fine print, it actually said it has to be declared an emergency by the paramedics. Now, ambulance cover costs you, I think, $120 or $140 a year for a family. Make sure you've got it and take it out in excess of your health insurance if you need to. I think that's pretty much everything I can um, fit in on the medical. So I'm going to just run back to the questions and see if anybody has any questions. Um, please do keep them coming. Yes, Anna, yes, definitely you do. And you do need vaccination records for high school students as well. Yes. Um, you, you need to have them on the um, air. So they need to be registered on air. Every school going child has to have their immunization records on um, on air. In fact, everybody has to. Cassie, you're most welcome. Bridges, okay. I think that's all the questions. I can see my wonderful B is online helping me out. Thank you so much, B. I appreciate that. All right, so in closing, um, what to bring, what not to bring. We've covered white goods, we've covered mattresses, linen, pillows, bits and pieces of what to look for in your removalist quotes and how not to get caught out and pay any extras. Um, medical, again, you're coming to a first world country, you will be looked after. It might take you a bit of time, and I'm talking about a couple of weeks at the most, to get you onto the systems, but you will be looked after. And if you need or looking for a referral to a doctor from your home country, speak to us. We move a lot of doctors and we've got some really great um, GPs on, the, on our list that we can supply with you. And, you know, I know some people sort of say, oh, no, I'll just, you know, I'm happy with an Australian doctor. When I lived in France, I would have loved to have had an English speaking doctor because when I'm in pain, I want to ex understand what they're doing to me. So I get it. So don't feel um, 
under any sort of pressure or I know some people on social media ask and then everybody says well oh, just have an Aussie doctor they're all good and da, da. so please if you need any recommendations don't hesitate to ask us um, if there's no more questions oh is health insurance part of Medicare Sonia um, no it's not um, I'm just trying to work out which country you might be from so I can um, give you a, <laughs> a bit more of a, a detailed answer. Medicare is our state funded insurance, uh, um, medical. So it's what we call bulk build. So when you arrive in Australia, if you want to go to a doctor and you want to, you're entitled to Medicare. So not all countries have reciprocal ag agreements with Medicare. Okay, so um, South Africa, for example, doesn't have a reciprocal agreement with Medicare, which means you can't automatically, depending on your visa, if you're coming on a PR visa, permanent resident visa, you are entitled to Medicare. So there's a few things, a few visas that can affect whether you're entitled to Medicare or not, but there's no reciprocal agreement between South Africa and Australia for you to go on to Medicare unless you're on PR. Um, and for those of you in England, um, Sonia, if you're perhaps in England, so when I talk about Medicare, I'm talking about the NHS. So just as you would have the NHS in the UK, and then you'd have private health care cover on top of that, that's what I'm referring to. So in Australia, if you went to a bulk build doctor, it would be completely covered by Medicare. If you went to a private practice doctor, then you would be paying. You, and you can have out-of-pocket expenses, just like you can have with, um, with the NHS. It's exactly the same here. I think with the out-of-pocket expenses, what you need to remember is that if you have a, a major surgery, a heart attack, give birth, something big, you might pay a few dollars for it. <laughs> but if you have something small, um, need a small surgery or need some medication or something, you get, you're probably going to have a few more out-of-pocket expenses. But when it comes to the really serious stuff, that's where you see Medicare really covers you. Okay. I think that's all the questions on that. I'm just going to refresh this once more and check. Okay, I think that's about it. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you found it useful. If you've got any questions, please feel free to email me. And um, I wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you so much for your time.